Good morning, or afternoon, or evening, wherever it is where you are. So this is a critique video to Thorin's uh, No Men content that he just made recently. And uh, I want to start out by putting it in context a little bit. So um, I'm a huge fan of both Thorin and Monty as far as like uh, when they first came out with their show, it was one of the first long form uh, esports shows that like was appealing to, I think, my demographic. And so I was really excited by that, and I, you know, it was freezing cold here, negative 30, so I would listen to it, you know, without watching the video with my hands in my pockets, walking to work. And I really appreciate what they bring to the scene. Um, and so I'm not disagreeing, uh, uh, rather, I totally agree with Thorne's point of view that it's his voice, and I think that uh, part of the reason that I keep listening to his stuff is because, uh, you know, he's developed his own voice. And so you can't really disagree with his content because it's just Thorne. Uh, you can you can debate with him, and that's great. That's what I'm doing right now with this video response. So this is a, a debate critique piece of his content for the No Man video. Um, and I also have to be clear that I I think Monty is a uh, is a good guy. Okay, so onto the content. Um, so I want to put this in a little bit of context. Like I don't agree with the I um, with the both the focus that you put on the No Man. Uh, idea and also the illustrations that you use to to bring it up. So I don't know if perhaps your argument like actually takes a little bit of a turn if you change the examples, but we'll see. So uh, I think the best way that I can put this is that like you do it as well. So for example, on your recent summoners insight with uh, the Copenhagen Wolves uh, coach Carl, um, you uh, essentially <laughs> I would guess. Uh, did the same thing that um, Reggie did to uh, Monty, you did to me when you were talking about like, oh, you know, anybody can be a sports psychologist and, you know, what's, what's the deal with authority? Like you just walk in and like you have a piece of paper and that gives you authority and I could walk in and say, oh, I'm a sports psychologist, people would listen to me and, and they'd be coachable. I don't think that that's uh, uh, true. So if we go back to your, doc your doctor's analogy that you had where you were like, okay, he does the work for a heart surgeon. He spends all the time in school. You know, he finally, he like spends all his time in practicum. At the end, he's a heart surgeon. And then some guy just puts on a white lab coat and puts on a heart surgeon like he's not a heart surgeon. Um, now, see, I think that I, I don't, I disagree with you on this uh, in both directions because I think actually like if that guy who just throws in the lab coat can actually do heart surgery and he can save my, I don't know, my brother's life or something, like I don't care if he can, if he calls himself a heart surgeon or not. Likewise, like if I'm a sports psychologist, I don't really care if anybody calls themselves a sports psychologist or not if they haven't put in the, the degree. What I care about is if they are able to do the actual work. And I don't believe that, um, that like, I, I base myself off of results and I base sports psychology off of results. So if you can talk to a player and uh, they, you know, like, understand their motivation and motivate them, uh, consistently always no matter what no matter what player no matter what circumstance no matter what's going on because you understand the science of motivation and you understand what's going on in that guy's brain you know in the neurons then that is uh, you know an essential part of the sports psychology toolkit and um, I don't think that people who have not put in the years of work and the years of research and the years of practical training uh, that and the years of working with like various athletes from different fields and Paralympians and Special Olympians and hockey teams and uh, you know elite swimmers and national level swimmers and five-year-olds like I don't think anybody who's not put in that work can actually do that especially if they don't have the theoretical background and research to understand exactly what's going on behind the scenes in the brain so um, let's look at coaching as well like you said um, I, I think that like the, the example you picked might just be illustrative, but I think that it's kind of silly because it's a Twitter argument, first of all. And also, I think that anybody who wants can call Monty not a coach. I think the only thing that matters is that Monty thinks that he's a coach and is working on that. Um, because like people have called me not a coach and I've been coaching for 10 years um, and I've got a master's degree in, in sports psych, which is essentially coaching. Um, and so like I don't have a big chip on my shoulder saying like, oh, look, like I've invested 10 years of my life in professional athletics coaching uh, and this guy is like you know just like got hired and he's calling himself a coach even though like he's coaching strategy and not really coaching people um, like I, it doesn't bother me at all because I think that like people should kind of strive towards that 
thing. And I think coaching, and I also, unfortunately, think journalism is a little bit like that. Like you, I think that they're, the people who have a degree in journalism and the people who are just tr striving for it should both be able to call themselves journalists and should be doing that. Now, where this comes from, uh, for me, is and what I want to recommend to you and everybody else out there in the esport community. So this is this is for the reason I'm making a video response instead of like a Twitter direct message is because I think this is beneficial for everybody, is to stop thinking uh, about the power that these people have over you with their actions, or with, not with their actions, but with their words as well. Um, and so here's a little bit of sports psychology for you. I think part of the reason that um, uh, I don't expect perfection out of people and that I'm not bothered by when they fall down and their values like don't line up with their actions um, is because everybody does it. Like the people you're accusing of doing it have done it uh, in the illustrations that you gave, but you've also done it, you know, in this show with Carl and, and various other times. So people are always failing to live up to being perfect in everybody else's eyes. And um, here's why it doesn't matter. Uh, you should live in the present. I live in the pre I'll frame this in terms of what I do, and you guys can take from the tools that you like. So I live in the present. I think that what happened like 10 minutes ago like doesn't exist anymore uh, insofar as much as it like affects my actions that I'm taking. So um, we don't want that to happen. So you should practice mindfulness in the, in the act of living and you should be able to simply um, recognize that like all of the cognitions, the thoughts and emotions and, and even physical sensations that you feel all day long every day and that you have about things do not exist outside of your neural system. Like they only have power in, in the way that people put them into behavior in the world and other than that they do not exist. Uh, secondly, I think you should live by the principle or I live by the principle to be so good that they can't ignore you. So like when somebody is like critiquing you or whatever a lot of people get into this like, oh, I have to like, there's this imaginary reputation artifact out in the world and like he's attacking me and I have to go defend it and like we're going to have this little mini war. Like none of that crap matters. The only thing that matters is results and doing. So if you're just consistently, awesomely good all the time, no matter what you do, uh, then nobody can disagree with that or rather they can disagree with it all they want and it doesn't matter because you're the one who affected change in people's lives. And so the people you touch know what matters, and that's what, what I care about. Um, number three, I like to spend all of my time in the clouds and in the dirt. So in the clouds, you're like so far above everything that's like happening. You're like thinking really big and really visionary, and you're like uh, focused on what really actually matters as far as your direction. And then in the dirt, you're just down there executing on what it is you need to do. You don't have time to like exist in the middle where like tons of people are like scrabbling and fighting for each other over like... Um, words and opinions and reputation and like attention graphs and like little spaces of like you know on the reddit front page and whatever okay so this goes along with my next point which is to think 10 times bigger instead of 10 percent bigger a lot of problems that we see from these YouTube people who are like all having this massive debate over the ethics and morality of YouTube and whether or not journalists are journalists and all this stuff they're all trying to like like grow what they're doing by 10%. They're trying to scrabble for that little bit of extra whatever. Um, I encourage people to think always 10 times bigger, not 10% bigger. And I like the example of the guy who kind of taught me this, uh, um, Peter Diamantis, who in his book Bold. So he said, um, you know, when you think 10 times bigger, you're, you're leaving the competition in the dust. There's nobody there to compete with anymore. He's mining asteroids. He said there's like one other person doing that at the moment, so he doesn't really have any competition. And um, I think that like if you do that clouds and dirt thinking, you're going to out hustle everybody else if you can execute on that. And so like it doesn't really matter if, if like somebody else says, you know, like I'm on the level with you right now and, and you're trying to compete with them because you know that you're going to put in the work, vision, visionary work and also the actual groundwork to get so far beyond them in two, five, ten years, it doesn't even matter where they are right now. So you're going to win, um, but it's going to be through results and actions, not through like fighting about fighting it out over like a transient internet portal. Um, okay, and the last thing that goes along with that is being able to take rejection. So there's two parts to this. The first is that uh, it's actually right. So every single time somebody critiques you, like a lot of times the way it's delivered is like, come on, dude, couldn't you have just like given me feedback instead of I don't know, uh, framed it in that way. Um, so. Yeah, the message is not all the times like uh, functionally wonderful, but 
um, it takes two to tango. If they see something in there that they don't like, they're a human being, they see something in you that you're doing that they disagree with, so that's like a valid viewpoint as far as like the universe goes. Um, and so uh, it takes a little bit of, um, you know, self-critique and self-examination to figure out like, what in there can I learn from? What in there, what in there can I grow from? What can I take from this obstacle and like use it as a, as a point of perfection, as a way of like making myself even better at what it is that I do. And I think that if you're doing everything right, you should be attracting criticism. So I'm not saying that like people should be striving for perfect no criticism, the opposite. If they're not getting critiqued about what you're doing uh, and, and get getting negative feedback on that, then you're probably not like being true enough to yourself or being bold enough to put yourself out there. And this all comes from my, the second part of this kind of feedback thing, which is learning how to take rejection. So um, this is really huge because a lot of people can't really handle it. And I, I'm going to give you, uh, everybody out there, an activity to go try. And so if you're on one of the teams that I coach, then you've already tried this, so you don't need to worry about it. But it's just like a real world example. It's called the Starbucks Challenge. You may have heard of it. You may have even done it. So simply go to Starbucks or some other fast food joint where they don't know you and the person behind the register has no vested interest in like building relationships for the company, right? Uh, don't try to go in the middle of the night. Go in the normal, normal time when there's a line and everything and, and get your order up to the register and ask for a discount, 15%. And your reason is that you want one. You can debate with them a little bit, whatever, but don't like make stuff up. So um, you're going to experience like this kind of emotion that you're creating as you go up there, you know, stress, embarrassment, whatever. You're going to notice you're trying to like get out of it uh, behaviorally and you're going to then like experience rejection and you're going to know about it beforehand, which makes it even more painful to, to like actually step up there and do it. Um, so... Uh, go to a blog like Fear Buster or, or his book, like 100 Days of Rejection. I think it's actually a post that he's turning into a book, uh, Rejection Proof. And check out the, those principles, the idea of exposing yourself to something until it becomes a tool and you realize that rejection is simply internal uh, most of the time. It has nothing to do with like your relationship with the people that you're, you're dealing with. So uh, this is my response. It's, it's in terms of a, a disagreement and I wanted to turn it into a debate. And I wanted to also talk about, you know, performance psychology kind of with uh, everybody who's seen this video. And um, I don't want you to doubt yourselves or kind of get involved in this. Like, um, like if you have somewhere to go with what you're doing, you shouldn't be like messing around in, in like what's happening right now on Reddit and YouTube and, and fighting over like what, what is and isn't esports. Like this is the problem with, that he pointed out very aptly, that Thorin pointed out aptly with the scene is that esports is like mucking and miring around in this like re reputation graph area. So like what Thorne is doing right is that he is doing, he's, he's in the dirt, right? He's putting out daily content. He's like just putting his uh, money where his mouth is and he's just working freaking um, like crazy. And so that's why he's going to win. That's why he's going to beat all of his detractors because none, nothing they say matters because he's actually just doing it, right? Um, but, uh, and, and I'm really happy with that, he, like, Thorin lost his job and, like, got this entrepreneurial fire and started doing this because um, that's what I think he should have been doing all along. But what I think that, like, he could do better, and you guys can also do better, is, um, and I can do better, is to uh, make sure you're not on anybody else's platform. Like, like, you're all on somebody else's land trying to set up a lemonade stand. Uh, and the truth is that, like, uh, YouTube is making money off of you and then giving you a cut. All right, this is how it works. So if you want to have a, a business or a brand or something that you're building online, you need to have a home that is your own, that you're driving people to and building up a base there of fandom uh, that is that is irrespective of platform, like that you have control over. And to be honest, the only tool on the internet that like you have complete control over at the moment that like other people cannot influence so much or like other companies is email. So you need to be collecting people's emails. This is like the fundamental online business proposition is like that you uh, find people who like you, get their address so you can go knock on their door and say, hey, let's hang out and then uh, start doing that. Uh, and of course, yes, you're also gonna leverage all the social media platforms, but they're not a long-term business strategy. 
They're not like a long-term growth strategy because at any point YouTube can say, hey, we're going to do the Facebook bait and switch and we're going to say that you need to now pay to access your subscribers. Like when you put something up, it doesn't appear on their newsfeed. It only appears on their newsfeed if they've actually watched you in the last week or something. Uh, Twitter can do the same thing. All of these people can sweep the rug out from under you in order to make more money and like nobody can do anything about it because that's their whole business plan. Uh, so um, if you're scrabbling over the YouTube views and like 17,000 like, you know, hits you get from the random Reddit, you know, second page, whatever, then um, you're already going to be losing on that because you're not fighting the right fight as far as like entrepreneurial brand building. Okay, so that's my response, and I'm curious to know what you think, so please reply uh, by video or pop by my Facebook page and leave a comment. Um, or I guess I might put this on YouTube, so you could do it there too. My site is mindgames.gg if you want to come to my, uh, you know, home turf and uh, check out what I'm doing.